uh, introductory uh, few slides into power electronic components and circuits. So power electronic components used in our semiconductor devices like diodes, fire resistors, etc. that we use in a power circuit of a converter and we would normally use them in a non-linear switching mode, so either on or off. The power electronic converter on the other hand is an assembly of the power electronic components and it will convert one or more of the following electrical characteristics from AC to DC from DC to AC it might be a change in frequency a change in voltage level or a change in current level or even the number of phases so it can be a single phase supply and then if it is a variable speed drive it can have a three phase output to drive the motor welcome Ronnie. can you hear us we've just started with the webcast and we're busy with, with in terms of contents looking at um, components and um, as mentioned here, power electronic converters as well as components. So starting off by looking at a rectifier, so that takes AC and converts it into DC. Inverter on the other hand takes DC and converts it into AC. Now we use this in both switch mode power supplies and variable speed drives. Now in an AC converter, where it converts one AC voltage and frequency to another AC voltage and frequency, there is normally an intermediary DC link with some smoothing. So again, if you take the example of your variable speed drive, it can have a single phase input. That will then be rectified, then have a DC link, and that DC uh, with the inverter will then be converted to a single or a three phase output supply. A DC converter on the other hand converts one DC voltage to another DC voltage and that usually requires an intermediary AC link. So we've got a high frequency AC transformer if it's a switch mode power supply that sits in the middle here which helps us to convert the voltage levels from um, whatever the input is to an, a DC output. Then electronic switch is something that electronically connects or disconnects an AC or DC circuit. And it can often be switched on and off from a gate terminal. As we mentioned, the power electronic devices that we use will be operated in a bistable mode, either blocking, which means it's fully switched off, or conducting, where it's fully switched on. Now with diodes, firesters and gate turn or firesters, they are inherently bistable. Transistors are not inherently bistable. So we must make certain that we bias them fully on or fully off. Otherwise they'll operate in the linear region which we, where they will overheat and get damaged. Now let's start off by looking at the power diodes. So there's the symbol. It's got a P and N junction. There is a possible module as you can see, similar to what you see over here, but we get it in various formats. And it's rated from a few amps to 1000 amps. So in terms of what we're looking at, especially for the variable speed drives, the most common is you have your insulated module, which has got a six pulse bridge. So there's six diodes 
basically in this module. Now the base of this module is electrically isolated and that means we can directly mount it on the heatsink. What's the limitations of power diodes? In the first place, when it's conducting, we have a forward ball drop. And that times the current will give us the conduction losses that we have. So it makes quite a difference if it's 0.5 and we have 10 amps, then it's 5 watts. But if it's 1 volt, then it's 10 watts conduction losses that we will have here when it's switched on. Reverse bias, we have a leakage current that's flowing. That's fairly small, unless we reach the reverse voltage breakdown, where it will then break through and it will damage the diode. Moving over to power fire resistors, so-called silicon controlled rectifiers. There is a different devices like the Triax, which has got two fire resistors connected back to back. Then we've got the gate turn of fire resistor, and we've got a field controlled fire resistor. So it is a four layer silicon wafer with three PN junctions. So it's got an anode and a cathode very similar to the diode, but now it's got a control third terminal or a control terminal called the gate. Again, there's the symbol. There you see the P injunctions. You get them also in fire the modules, and which will then be very similar to what we've just used for the diode. We'll use the same one, same more type of module uh, if it's a controlled rectifier instead of just a diode rectifier. Now, how can a fire resistor be brought into forward conduction? It can be by applying a positive current gate pulse. That's the normal way. That's the way we want to switch it on. So it must just be a gate pulse with suitable amplitude and duration. Unfortunately, it can also be brought into conduction if we have excessively high forward voltage or a high rate of rise of forward voltage, also called a high DVDT, or an excessively high temperature. Now these three ways is what we want to prevent, because then we've got no control over when it will switch on. How do we turn it off? Is when it becomes reversed bias, if we have an AC supply, then it will automatically turn off if it where the uh, voltage waveform goes negative, or where if we can get the forward current to fall below the holding current, then it will also switch off. And turn off can be controlled externally by either the line or by the load. Again, what's the limitations of the power fire resistors? In the immediately see that we've got a higher voltage drop across it. Again, there's leakage current. And in this case, we've got reversed and forward voltage breakdown. So breakdown in reverse, but in if the voltage goes too high, as we've mentioned previously, excessively high forward voltage, that will also switch it on. So that's also a problem. That's the components. So let's look now at the first building block in a variable speed drive, which is the rectifier. Now, in our rectifier, we have either the fire resistor or the diodes. And commutation is where it will commutate the current from one device to the other. So the one device will go from blocking to conduction. So we have a turn off, turn on, and a turn off period. And during this turn on and turn off period, we have a high 
power dissipation, which we can, which is also called the switching losses. So that switching losses will then increase if we increase the frequency if we if we switch it on and off on a more regular basis. Now the tendency is to use higher switching frequency in our modern pulse width modulation inverters for or in order to achieve better wave shapes. So a high pulse width modulated frequency will increase the losses because of the increased number of switching cycles. Now the question is how can we reduce the losses? For having a power electronic device with a low leakage current. And normally the leakage current is quite small, so it's not going to make a significant difference. Low forward wall drop, that makes a significant difference. Because that can double the conduction losses. If you go from 0.5 volt on voltage to 1 volt. High switching speed, which then reduce the commutation period. And low triggering losses. But this is normally the most significant. Switching, depending on the frequency, can also become significant. So here's the commutation sequence. So we have diode D1 that's conducting. And because we've got a three phase waveform that we apply, at one stage D2 will become forward biased. And full load, full load current was flowing through diode D1, but now slowly D2 will take over the current until the full load current is now flowing through D2. So that is a commutation that happens from D1 to D2. Now the overall commutation time is direct proportional to the inductance. So if you want to increase that you can manage that by increasing the inductance. The current and the voltage is something that we don't really have control over. So if you want to change the commutation time, then we look at increasing the inductance. And commutation happens because we've got a free phase supply and we normally have six diodes or six thyristors and depending on where the phase voltage is as we say we'll start off by D1 conducting and then D2 will take over from D1 until it conducts the full load current. So commutation initiated by external changes that's our free phase mains voltage so we can have line commutated, we can also have load commutated, and we can have self commutated where we have an internal converter voltage. So here is just the different components in terms of the different phase voltages. And they are all 120 degrees apart. Now what happens during this rectification, we've got a DC current, which can be steady if we have sufficient inductance, and there's our DC current. Our AC current, however, comprises segments of the DC current. So there is for phase A, and then we have similar for phase B, and phase C, 120 degrees apart, and that will then eventually give us the DC current with those um, which will be steady depending on the inductance. That will change the ripple component. So here's the phase voltage, the output voltages, and the different phase current components, which then makes up that DC current. So the DC voltage is not smooth portions of the six voltage pulses, and that's why we call it the six pulse rectifier bridge. 
The average DC voltage is, we get that by integrating over a 120 degree portion, and then we end up with the formula V um, DC voltage is 1.35 times the RMS. Okay, that's similar. Now that's if we use diodes, but we can also use fire resistors. Now we need a forward voltage across the fire resistor, and if we didn't apply a positive pulse, it will switch it on. So by using fire resistors, we can now control the output voltage. And it's not a fixed voltage, as in the previous case. So it will be the same as the diode bridge if it's the fire is triggered at the instant when the forward voltage across it becomes positive. And then it will operate with a zero delay angle. And then we'll have exactly the same formula. However, we have a fire resistor bridge because we can now control when we want to switch it on. And the, we can delay that instant, and that delay is then measured in degrees. And it's called the delay angle or the firing angle. And the purpose is to control the magnitude of the DC output voltage. So if we have a big delay, we'll have a small DC voltage. So here we can see, if we then control it, then that is our waveform that we will see. And that will give us a certain average output voltage. But what we also can see is that we get a distorted current waveform. It's not sinusoidal, but it's distorted. So again, again, if we integrate over a period of 120 degrees, this is what we get. This was the previous one with the diodes. But now we add plus alpha, and as you can see, if that angle is zero, then VD becomes the same as the diode rectifier. So our DC voltage decreases as the delay angle is increased. So if that angle is 90 degrees, then our DC output voltage is equal to zero because this portion above the line and that below the line is exactly equal, which will then give us a zero average. If we delay it further, then we can get a negative voltage, as you can see on with this waveform. So it becomes an inverter. So if that is zero, then the converter behavior will be like a resistor float, absorbs active power. Between zero and 90 degrees, it's a combination of resistive and inductive absorbs active power. 90 degrees is inductive, there's no active power because you've seen the DC voltage is zero. Higher than 90, it becomes an inductive load, it becomes a source of active power. So we've now changed the voltage around. Now the DC load current is never completely smooth. At the lay angles higher than 60 degrees, the DC output voltage becomes discontinuous. So for a smooth DC current, what we need is a series inductance. And for complete smoothing, that should be fairly large. Now this formula that we said is not completely true. It only holds up for the lay angles up to 75 degrees. And experiences shows that for higher than 60 degrees, the average DC voltage will be higher than the theoretical value, as indicated over here. So it depends on the load. If that is an inductive load, then it will follow the formula that we have given. But if it's a resistive inductive or a resistive load, then you can see in I at 90 degrees, instead of the, the DC output voltage being zero, it's not zero, it's a different value, it's still higher than zero. So that just depends on the load, then we can get a different formula than what 
we previously said. So you, with your measurement, you might measure a higher voltage than what you theoretically have calculated. What's the practical application of this? Is a DC variable speed drive. So I have my rectifier, which now controlled. So now I can control the voltage that I apply to the DC motor, which means I can control the speed of the motor. Now my DC drive can operate in different quadrants. It can be forward driving or it can be forward braking or it can be reverse driving in the opposite direction and reverse braking. But with what we have over here it's not possible to operate in all the quadrants. If I want to operate in all four quadrants I need a four quadrant DC converter. So we, it requires additional reverse converter bridge. Because if I only have the previous one, then I can only have current flow in one direction. So if I want to return the current flow to the source, then I need another um, converter bridge, but in the opposite direction. So with this, it can operate in all four quadrants.